Welcome to worship today. We are so glad that you are with us. It is our honor to be able to worship alongside you. You know, as I was getting ready this morning, I felt like I was reminded about God being a God of wonders. And I think that's probably what we've been trying to get across to you these past couple of series, talking about God of the impossible and now talking about seeing Jesus in our everyday lives. He has never stopped being a God of wonders. He's never stopped doing the impossible. We are ready now to go worship him because he is worthy. Won't you come with us now into the presence of God?
place this morning and to the spaces where you are watching online. Thank you so much for joining us. It's going to be a great, great morning of worship. And how do we know that? We know that because we came in this morning and there was no power here at all in the church. And we practiced an acoustic set after practicing our full set on Thursday. We were ready to go. I think God just wanted to see if we were going to be faithful and gather together anyway. And here you are. We are so glad that you are with us this morning. You can take a seat and Pastor Dennis is going to come up with a few announcements. Yeah, it's uh, been a good morning. At 9.15, we uh, were looking to move this service into the sanctuary so that we could see something, and all of a sudden, the lights came on. So uh, things are different. We're a little behind, and those of you that were trying to catch us at 9.30 obviously found out that we weren't on at 9.30, but we got on as soon as we could, and the, the tech team has uh, been trying to get everything put together very, very quickly, and sound check went really quick today. <laughs> That was the fastest sound check I've ever heard, but we are glad you are here. We're glad you're joining with us online as well. It is a wonderful day to be in the Lord's presence. Uh, just a couple of quick announcements. Um, in June, our UMW will be doing a yard sale. Now, they weren't able to do it last year because of COVID. This year, uh, there's going to be some different kinds of things, but it's going to be pulled off. So some of you have two years' worth of stuff that you've been waiting for an opportunity. This is it, but not yet. Um, it's in June. You'll be getting, in about a month from now, you'll be getting information about when and where to bring stuff. We don't have room for it yet, but you can um, start to get your, your uh, stashes put together to be able to make that happen in June. Uh, the other thing to announce is we are, have been in the process now of trying to revitalize and renew our website, and it went live last night, May 1st. Um, you can go on to purpledoorchurch.com or gcumc.org and go into the, uh, the website. It has all the same information, but we've tried to make it easier to, to uh, decipher and get around to. It's not 100% complete yet, but it looks nice. So check it out. Um, we will eventually have a, the ability to be able to stream directly to the website, and there's going to be a lot of new advantages. We can take advantage of that. But check it out uh, along with our app between those two you should be able to get all the information about what's happening and taking place at the Purple Door Church at any time. And so we're, we're hopeful for that. We are here, and we're thankful to have lighting. I'm thankful because I was having to yell to preach at the earlier service, and I didn't think I could do that for three services. So um, now that may not be a blessing to you, but it is to me. So we are here to worship. We're here to let the light shine within each of us. Let's come and continue to worship. Would you stand?
come to worship him this morning, would you sing this? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord? Oh, he's worthy of our praise. Oh, who can stop the yesterday morning, um, the thought that God is a God of signs and wonders came to mind. And let us not forget that. Let us not forget that he still does miracles, that he is still doing impossible things. And I think that's one of the things that we have wanted to remind you as we've gone over these last, these last couple series, God of the impossible. And we can see Jesus working in, in our lives in every single day if we have eyes to see it. He is a good and loving Father, and He is here in this place for you. He has come before you. We have prayed for you before we gathered in this place this morning. Would you pray with me now? God, we love you and we honor you, and we thank you that you are still a God of signs and wonders, that we can build our lives upon the firm foundation that you have given to us, God, your, your great faithfulness. We can look back and we can see that you have never, ever left us. You've never forsaken us. You've never let us down. You've always been a sure foundation. God, may we take that in this morning. May we grasp the gravity of knowing how good you are this morning so that we lift our hearts, we lift our voices, we lift everything that we are to you, that this becomes a sanctuary of praise for who you are. God, let us not hold back, but let us give our whole selves to you, God. And we welcome you into this space to settle in right beside us. We love you and we honor you and we praise you this morning in your name. Amen. him up in this place.
Proclaiming that we will put our trust in you. Making the conscious effort to say, you are my God, and no matter what happens in my life, 
No matter what I see going on right now, I am putting my trust in you. Because you are a God of wonders and a God of miracles. You are a God who is constant. You are a God who is worthy of our praise. We do not deserve you, God. Thank you for loving us like you do. Thank you for coming into this place and into our spaces, into our homes, into our cars, into our workplaces, wherever we may find ourselves. God, we are grateful that you meet us where we are. And God, we pray now that you will open up our hearts and our minds to what Pastor Dennis has to speak into them, God, that you will enlighten us, that you will touch the very cores of our souls with your words. We love you so much in your name. Amen. You may be seated. I did want to remind you that we are going to be participating in the uh, Sacrament of Holy Communion today. If you did not pick up, those of you that are here, a celebration cup as you came in, they are out in the Great Hall and you can, you can uh, get those. For those of you at home, um, what we have been doing in, to allow everybody to participate at the table, um, we're just asking if you want to be a part of communion, if you have juice and bread, that would be fine, or maybe water and a cracker, whatever you may have. We're going to bless those uh, before we begin so that we all come to one table, irregardless of where we are. But um, just to allow you an opportunity to prepare for that. The scripture this morning, as we continue in our uh, study. We've been looking at the opportunities where Jesus appeared after the resurrection. And um, in doing that, we are at John 21. I want to read verses 4 through 9. We'll pick up more of the stories as we go on. But early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. And he said, Throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. And then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, It is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from shore, about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. Let us open with prayer. Lord, thank you for your loving grace to understand us even when we don't understand ourselves at times. That we may know that we're here because you have called us and that we are yours. Join us in this time. Fill us with your word that in all that we do, we see you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Now, I do need to um, admit that I misspoke last week when I was talking about doubting Thomas. And I said Thomas was on the boat and was the one that spotted Jesus. And it wasn't. It was John. I read into the scripture something that was not there. Now, it worked really well last week in the Doubting Thomas sermon. It made a really great point, but just um, forget it. Today, we're looking at this passage as we uh, continue in this story of what's happening with Jesus after the resurrection. And this is actually the third time that Jesus will appear to the disciples. The first time was um, in the upper room after Mary came and told them they went and saw, and that evening Jesus appeared to the disciples in the upper room. Thomas and Judas were not there. And then the next time was a week later when he appeared specifically to be able to show Thomas that he was alive. Now, this is the third time. Now, in the in the days between those, Jesus has appeared to over 500 people 
who were witnesses to the living Christ. And now it's probably 10 to 15 days after the resurrection. And the disciples are out in a boat fishing, and Jesus appears on the Sea of Galilee. Now, to really understand this story, we need to go back and refresh. It actually starts at the Passover meal on what we call Monday Thursday in the upper room. Jesus had just gathered with the disciples. He had instituted what we call communion with the bread and the cup. And after that, Jesus said these words in Mark 14, 26 through 31. When they had sung a hymn, sounding pretty Methodist there, um, then they went out to the Mount of Olives. They left from the upper room. They went to the Mount of Olives to the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus told them, you will all fall away, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. And Peter declared, even if all fall away, I will not. Truly, I tell you, Jesus answered, today, yes, but tonight, before the rooster crows twice, you yourself will disown me three times. But Peter insisted emphatically, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the others said the same. Now, we know that in the Garden of Gethsemane, after prayers, Jesus was arrested. The disciples were hiding. And in the course of that night, Peter had, in three different occasions, people came up to Peter and said, weren't you one of his? We saw you with that guy. Weren't you one of his followers? And each time Jesus said, no, it wasn't me. He was afraid for his life. That was a mob. They were crazy. No, you're mistaking me with somebody else. Three times. And when the rooster crowed the second time, Peter realized it, and his life was forever changed. I will never disown you, Lord. You know, we know the story that after Mary came back and told them, Peter and John ran down to the tomb, and they looked, and both saw it was empty, and John came out believing that Jesus had resurrected, but Peter came out shaking his head. Now, part of that is that Peter had a lot of stuff going on in his head right now. Peter saw himself. Peter was the one that it was called the rock that Jesus was going to build his church on. And he had denied he even knew Jesus three times. Peter was a mess. You know, when you do those things and you know you shouldn't and you do them anyway, and then it's like, why did I do that? And some of those we can move on, but some of those haunt us every day. Why, why, why? Why didn't I do what I wanted to do? Why did I do that? And we live with the consequences of that. But for Peter, he knew that he had turned his back on Jesus. He knew that he had failed. He knew that he had made a promise and he didn't fulfill it. And even if Jesus were alive today, it wouldn't be the same. Peter was concerned because even if Jesus did resurrect from the dead, he's never going to have any faith in me again. He's never even going to look me in the eye again. He's not going to want anything to do with me because in his hour and time that he needed me the most, I abandoned him. Can you imagine the anguish Peter went through in those 10 to 15 days after the resurrection? The guilt, the unworthiness, the anguish of knowing that the one person he had the most faith in the world, he had turned his back on. Now, he didn't know what else to do, and so he was a fisherman by trade, so he went fishing. Get his mind off of it. Go back to what he knew. Now, 
he went out with several of the other disciples, and they went out fishing. They fished all night, caught nothing. Now, I love to fish. I, I really love to go out in May when the crappie are hitting and bring in about 40 or 50 crappie. Now, that's fun. But I also enjoy standing in the Maumee River in the, in the rapids and throwing a line out there for about six hours and not getting anything. Because every time it's this cast is going to do it. I know where that fish is now. This cast, okay, next cast. But there's something about that, and, and that's what Peter needed to get his mind off of it. Now, this is the second time that Peter has been in the boat and not caught any fish. The first time, if you go back in the scriptures, the first time Jesus was there and said to them, throw your nets on the other side, and Peter's response was, who are you anyway? I'm the fisherman here. I know that. We've been fishing all night. There's no fish on that side. But they did and caught fish. And Jesus' response to him was, now, trust me, follow me, and let me make you a fisher of men. And so here they are again. They're out in the boat. They've not caught anything. They're coming into shore. They're tired. They're hungry. And they see a man on the shore, and he's got a fire going. And John recognizes that it's him on shore and calls him out. Peter isn't quite so sure, and he, he puts his cloak on. He had taken it off while they were fishing. He puts it on. He jumps out of the boat, and he runs into shore, and the disciples are following. Now, Peter, with all this stuff going on in his head, is probably not sure if he wants to see Jesus there or if he'd rather Jesus wasn't there. But they show up. You see, the first time when they hadn't caught anything and Jesus said, throw your net on the other side, God called Peter to be his disciple. This time he tells the disciples, throw your nets on the other side, and they caught more fish than they knew what to do with. And it gives him an opportunity to reinstate Peter. Now, after eating, Jesus had a fire going. They cooked up some fish, and they ate. And after eating, Jesus sat down with Peter and looked him in the eye. Peter probably couldn't look him straight in the eye. But Jesus didn't condemn him. He didn't chastise him. He didn't reject him. He ate with him. And he gave him a new commandment. The rest of that story, after the scripture I read earlier, starting in, in John 21, 15, when they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my lambs. And again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, then take care of my sheep. And a third time, Jesus said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. And at the end of that, that setting, he said to Peter, follow me. Which is what he said to Peter the first time when he called him to be a disciple. So three times, Peter denied that he even knew Jesus. Three times he was trying to protect his own life and turned away from Jesus. Three times. And three times Jesus says to him, Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you really love me? Peter, do you really, really, really love me? And Peter's getting exasperated now. I'm trying to tell you, Lord, you know me. You're tr I'm trying to let you know I love you more than anything else in all the world. You think Jesus was trying to forgive him or for him to see his own forgiveness three times for a purpose? I think it had to do with the three times in the garden 
when he said, I don't know the man. And so Jesus says to him in each of those times, I want you to care for my sheep, feed my lambs, feed my sheep. I want you to do something about it, Peter. I think he was reinstating Peter to his divine call. He saw in Peter what Peter didn't see in himself. And in the midst of the anguish and and all the stuff that Peter was going through, he was trying to give him some peace. Because life is not based on us. It's not based on our interests and our needs. As much as the world may seem to think so now, it's not about us. It's about what Jesus does for us when we are forgiven, when we have been given the salvation of of Jesus, when Jesus has walked into our lives and has said, do you love me? Do you really love me? And we've responded, yes, Lord, yes. It's not enough to just feel good about it. It's not enough to just say, I've got it. And we can sit in church with our head held high and feel great about that. That's not what it's about what we do with it. It's not enough to say, yes, Lord, I love you. Then Jesus' command is, then feed my sheep. Follow me. John 3.16 says, for God so loved the world. If we want to be like Jesus, we need to love like Jesus loved. When we have Jesus' love and assurance and grace in our lives, it doesn't stop with us. We're the conduits to be sharing God's grace and love to the world around us. It's not complete until we've opened up our own lives so that we, in turn, are sharing God's love, that we are feeding his sheep and caring for his lambs. You see, that's what Jesus is all about. And what he was trying to tell Peter is don't give up because you've sinned. Don't give up because you've failed. If you love me, then follow me. Feed my sheep. Don't get so caught up in ourselves that we can't hear the voice of Jesus calling in to us. The world was in darkness, so God sent a light. Who can you be reaching out to? Who can you be feeding, caring for, loving, picking up? Again, it's not enough for us. But how do we share that? How do we feed God's sheep? How do we make a difference in this world? It's not by hiding and denying Christ to protect ourselves. It's by opening ourselves up and being the hands and feet of Christ. That's how we do it. It's how we share God's love. Who are the people in your life right now that you can think about, that you need to be getting a hold of to let them know you're thinking about them, praying about them? Who are the people that, that you see by the side of the road or who you read about or who you, you don't even know about but somebody else does that your heart goes out to? What can you do to feed them, to care for them? You know, we as a church have our Perpador Community Ministries, and we're helping here, and we're helping there, and we're doing all this wonderful stuff, but it's not just the church. Jesus isn't just saying, church, feed my sheep. He's saying, if you love me, feed my sheep. That's a personal call to every one of us to open up our hearts and lives for God to lead us. Peter did become the rock the cornerstone of the Christian church. He went on after that and did wonderful, great things in God's name. And that's what God calls us to do as well. Revelation 3.20 says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone opens the door, I will come in. We've all seen that painting. That's part of the story in Revelation about the church of Laodicea and their apathy. They're the lukewarm church that God doesn't really want to have anything to do with. But, but what that scripture says is Jesus is standing at the door and knocking, and if anyone opens it, I will come in. It doesn't take a lot of people. It doesn't take a whole church. It says, if any one of you open that door, I will come in. And that's God's call for us, to be Jesus. 
How would you answer that question? Do you love me? Would Jesus ask you that? Well, yes, Lord. Then feed my sheep. But, but do you really love me? Really, really love me? Yes, Lord. And take care of my lambs. They need it. But do you really, really, really love me? Would you do anything for me? Would you get out of your comfort zone for me? How can we say no? And the answer that God's wanting from us is Jesus says to each of us, then follow me and feed my sheep. Amen. We're going to share in the act of communion today. For those of you that are new to the Celebration Cup, they can be a little um, difficult. There's a cellophane strip on the very top clear that peels back to expose the wafer, and then underneath is the purple cellophane that pulls back the cup. Now, in the last service, we had no lights. It, it didn't make it any easier. <laughs> you have lights, so we can do this. Jesus... Before this story that we looked at today took place, Jesus was in the upper room with his disciples. And before he challenged them in the Mount of Olives, he gave them this celebration that we celebrate in the church on a regular basis. It's an opportunity to remember and relive what God has done for us so that we can share in God's presence each and every time we come to this table. And our table is not just here. Our table is where you are. It's wherever we are is our table. And we come into God's presence in, in that every time we do. Jesus took the bread that night and broke it and blessed it and gave it to his disciples and said, this represents my body broken for you. And every time you take of it, I want you to remember and let it feed on your hearts. And then he took the cup and he blessed it and he gave it to them and he said, now this is the cup of the new covenant. This is a cup that will represent my shed blood on the cross. Every time you drink of this, I want you to remember the gift that God has given to you and the power that God has given to us. Let us pray. Almighty and gracious God, as we come into this place, we celebrate these elements that you have given to us. Whatever they may be, wherever we may be, however large this table may be, we come acknowledging that we may not be perfect, but in you we can be. We take these elements that represent your body, your blood, that they may bless us and nourish us and empower us to be able to move forward with all that you have in store for us. And Lord, at this time, we just open this table to you. May you bless it with us. In Christ's name, amen. The body of Christ that Jesus gave to us all was meant to feed us on our journey, to empower us in God's presence. The body of Christ given for each of us. And likewise, after supper, Jesus took the cup and gave it to the disciples, and he said, this cup is the remembrance and the symbolization of, of a time that is soon to be when I will die on a cross, and this represents the blood that will be shed. But it's not blood that will be wasted, it will be blood that will be, bring forgiveness and assurance and grace to all who believe. The blood of Christ given for each of us each of us may, as we drink it, know that God is refreshing us in all that we do. The blood of Christ given for you. Let us pray. 
Lord, in the midst of all that you do, we give you thanks. Bless this time that we gather at your table. For those of us that are dealing with our own guilt and, and issues, we know that it is at the table that you look at us as well. May this table bless us, may it encourage us, may it feed us, and, and, and allow us to go forward in all that we do. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.
are available whenever we open our arms to accept the love and grace and forgiveness that God gives us we make ourselves available as you go from this place today as you go into your lives wherever you may be we make ourselves available open our eyes Lord open our ears we may see the lambs the sheep may we be your vessels as you call us to follow you Go in the grace and peace of a God that loves us always and is with us forever. May you be a blessing to this community and to the world around us, Purple Door. Go in peace. Know that you are loved not only by God, but those that are in this place and online and around us. And know that God goes with us always. Have a great week. Thanks for joining us today. We are glad that you were able to worship with us. We want to highlight just a few things for you before you go. Um, our UMW, which is our women's ministry of our church, they are getting ready to have their annual yard sale. Now, last year they could not have that yard sale because of the pandemic, but this year we are back to business. So we want you to be able to gather up all the stuff that you want to get rid of. You know, one person's trash is another person's treasure. So be gathering all of those things up and be looking for specific information about drop-off information and, and when you can come shopping as well. We also want to remind you that Bible studies are always happening. We have some new ones that are getting ready to start up. If you're interested in our Bible studies, you can check them out on our website and you can contact Pastor Brandy to get um, plugged in. One last thing is I want to remind you that you can give through our app. If you go down here to the purple heart button and press give, you can set up a one-time gift. You can set up a recurring gift. We have been able to do tremendous ministry because of the financial contributions you have made. You are making an impact on the city of Grove City and not just our immediate city, but beyond. And we are so grateful to partner with you in those ways. We want you to know that we love you. We want you to know that we are always praying for you and we are always, always just so grateful to be able to worship with you. We hope that you have the best week. Go in peace.